So welcome to the IMH um, Lunch Time webinar. Uh, today's webinar um, a title will be Better Than Well, the UK's first university-led collegiate recovery program for addiction, led by uh, Dr. Ed A. and Luke Trainor. Um, briefly, I will introduce to all of you uh, Dr. Ed A. is clinical reader at the Institute for Mental Health at the University of Birmingham and consultant in addiction psychiatry with Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. Much of his research focuses on developing and testing innovative pharmacological and psychological interventions for tackling addiction, with a particular focus on social network interventions and peer-led recovery support services. Among some of his distinctions, Ed is the current president of the Society for the Study of Addiction, and he was appointed national recovery champion by the UK government in May 2019. And also with us will be today Luke Trainor who is the program manage, uh, manager of the Better Than Well Collegiate Recovery Program and a master mental health student in long-term recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. Luke has been involved in recovery community activism for more than a decade and has worked in recovery-focused in recovery -focused user led services for many years. Luke's research interests are in addiction and recovery narratives, stigma, disclosure, and bringing recovery philosophy into public policy. In today's webinar, Ed and Luke will introduce their Better Than Well Collegiate Recovery Program, which is the first university-led collegiate recovery program in the UK that started at the University of Birmingham in September 2021 last year. More specifically, this presentation will review the background and supporting evidence based for collegiate recovery programs before describing the process of development of the Better Than Well program through the eyes of some of its participants. And finally, they will lay out a potential research agenda for evaluating its imp impact in Birmingham and beyond. So before just starting the webinar, as a reminder, so please uh, write all your, all your, so this presentation will be around 40 minutes in total, and then at the end we will have 20 minutes for, for questions. So please write all your questions in the Q&A, as well maybe specifying uh, whether the question is for Ed or for Luke. And then at the end in the 20 minutes, so I will be chairing the, the Q&A and asking the questions from, from that section to, to Ed and Luke, thank you. So Ed, you are ready now. <laughs> thank you very much, Isabel, that's really kind. Um, great, so what I'm gonna do today is, um, we, we have about 40 minutes worth of, of uh, presentation. About half of that will be me talking, so I'm going to start with an introduction to what we've been doing um, and a bit, a bit about how we've progressed. The real bulk of what I want to cover today, though, will be with the two uh, gentlemen sitting in the room with me here um, who are going to talk about the experiences of the students in the, in, in the programme. And then we'll come back to me to, to, to wrap up and, and talk a little bit about um, the research uh, evidence base and what, what we plan to do uh, moving forward. So I'll start off by Attempting to share my screen. This is where we take a deep breath. Okay, is that working? You can see my slide, can you? It's never entirely clear what's going on. No, there we go. Great. So let me just move that. Oh, no. Okay, so. Um, let me kick off with with the with the slide. So what I want to talk about really is is um, the broad topic of addiction. And by addiction, I'm focusing on a whole spectrum of both use of substances, um, drugs, illicit and prescribed, alcohol, but also uh, problem behaviours. A uh, good example of which is gambling. And in this first slide, hopefully you can see um, how I normally introduce this topic because it's a very broad. Uh, spectrum of issues that we've got to cover. At the top of the screen, you can see at one end, I've got people who use these different substances or behaviours in a purely recreational sense and don't really generate any problem from them. And in fact, probably generate quite a bit of pleasure. At the other end of the spectrum, so the right hand side of the screen, you've got the approximately one in 20 people who develop really significant problems. And this might be what you would call uh, addiction. So these, these are people who not only um, uh, experience significant uh, impairment in their physical, psychological, social health, but also have this unique facet of addiction, the, the, the inability to stop once you've started. 
um, which is a really quite uh, unpleasant and um, difficult to tackle issue. In between those two poles, you've got a huge group of people, which I often describe as the as the iceberg that's below the water. If the people with, with dependents are the, are the bit that you can see, below that there's a huge group of people who are starting to develop problems. And some of these people may turn back and, 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 and gain control over their issues. Others may unfortunately de um, develop into people with, with severe addiction. And it's quite difficult very often to tell the difference between the two. But the, the influencing factors between who will go in which direction are, are, are really multiple and complex and, and, and involve an interplay between that person's genetics and, and neurobiology and the environment and the, and, the, and the life that they've lived up until that point. If you've got a complex range of problems like that, there's never going to be one solution to them. So at the bottom of the screen, you've got a range of different uh, potential um, strategies for intervening or, or helping with these issues. The two at the right hand end, so treatment and recovery support are what I'm going to focus on today. But uh, further upstream, a whole range of other interventions are needed. S um, spotting people early with, with the issues and intervening can be a really effective way of diverting people off a potentially lifelong problem. And, and general education and, and other factors are, are, are really important as with any other public health condition. But I wanna focus, the focus of what we're gonna talk about today is that right hand end of the spectrum. It, I'm gonna come back to the other, the rest of it because that's important, but the, what we're gonna focus on is the, is the right hand end. And particularly this concept of recovery. So, um, People that, that develop severe addictions, it, it, the best way to think of that is as a chronic condition, very similar to things like diabetes, hypertension, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These are, these are things that, that medicine can help, but can't cure. But with the right, um, the right uh, interventions and the right support, the person with those issues can live a full and, and perfectly normal life. The difference with other issues in medicine is that these uh, require less of the expert uh, intervention of professionals and more in the way of self-management. And that's where the concept of recovery comes in. So rather than thinking that an addiction problem is over once you've stopped using the substance, if you have that severe um, one in 20 uh, condition, this is a chronic problem that needs probably lifelong uh, management. And Stopping the substance is an important first part of it very often, but you could easily stop drinking, for example, by never leaving the house, never speaking to anyone, never going online and having no contact with alcohol, but you'd have absolutely no quality of life. So the concept of recovery has, has arisen in the last 20, 25 years, particularly in the United States, to describe the change in lifestyle that is required very often to, to manage addiction. And the other two components, apart from control over your, your substance use or your behavior, is maximizing your physical and mental health and also um, living a satisfying, meaningful life as defined by the person themselves. That would be different. The components of that would be very different depending on who you are. But it certainly involves um, participation in the rights, roles and responsibilities of society. People with severe dependence moving into recovery, the, the key things to note are at the top of the screen here, there's no one way of doing that. We, we know no one treatment or one approach that solves that problem. It's a, it's a range of different strategies that, that are required. Different ones are um, being beneficial at different stages. It's best to think of that as a process. So it's not, it's not as I say, a one-off intervention. It's an ongoing uh, activity. It requires quite a bit of um, hope and, and, and support. Um, and almost always involves connection with other people. Addiction is very much a um, uh, use of substances and behavior often starts off uh, as a perfectly appropriate response to the person's environment, either for, for pleasure or sometimes for coping with adverse events or, or trauma. But in some people, addiction takes on a life of its own and, and the, the substance or the behavior starts running away with the person, generating problems as it does. And it can be really hard to row back from that position and that's where connection with others is, is a crucial part. And it's, and it's good to think of, uh, of recovery as a, an accrual of positive events. Some people enter their addiction with lots of social or recovery capital, but others don't. 
And the process of recovery is often about trying to build those elements of capital in order to, to, to help someone live a, a, a life in recovery. When we think about the, the time course we're dealing with here, this, this diagram summarizes research from um, 50 years of, of work in, in, in the research field in this area. And what this shows is that um, addiction is, is, is often a long-term problem. Most people um, go something like four or five years with active addiction before they even seek help, whether that's from um, a mutual aid or, or, or peer-led organization like the, the 12 Step Fellowships or from professional treatment services. And that time will be filled with lots of self-initiated attempts to, to, to control the substance. Even once help seeking has been initiated, the usual pattern is that people cycle in and out of different forms of help or different forms of treatment, lapsing and relapsing on the way. And on average, it's said that, that it's, it's usually about eight years before someone enters the initial stages of recovery. Even at that point, because it's a complex problem, the first year in abstinent recovery can be really uh, difficult. They, and, and often there's a pattern of the second half of that year um, leading to, to lapse and relapse again. And this can be really difficult when someone's trying to um, negotiate this, this pathway. But the good news is, is that once you get through that first year, that first couple of years, things get easier. And once you get out to five years, you're rather akin to the five year survival rate with treating uh, cancer. Uh, your risk of, of lapse and relapse has dropped to roughly the, the, the general population um, risk. And so one of the things we've got to consider in, in, in ways of helping people is how do we generate long term support to, to help someone uh, move from a problematic situation of addiction through to this uh, long term abstinent recovery. And that's the area that we're going to we're going to think about uh, today. Now, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today are university students. So in the UK, that usually means um, young people of the age between roughly 18 and 21, 22. Although, of course, uh, lots of students now, as student numbers have increased in the UK, lots of students enter uh, university at a much uh, older age, even for an undergraduate degree. But that young person, that, that, that emerging adult period is a crucial point because that seems to be the time when um, addiction really takes hold in most people. It's the period between mid-teens and mid-twenties is, is the time when um, uh, impulsivity increases greatly. There's a, great, there's a greater interest in, in um, dangerous and, and, and rewarding activities, but without the full um, higher cognitive control to, um, to keep a lid on those things. And of course, the transition to university is a massive change in, in, in people's lives. So on this slide, you've got some of the tasks that, that young people need to, um, to tackle when they're, um, when they're moving into university. So they're, they're changing a complete, they're, they're swapping a solid um, network of social support from school for a completely different network of new people from often from all over the country. They're learning to live outside parental supervision for the first time. They're, they're having to set their own um, educational goals and, and, and subsequently career goals. And they're trying to build healthy peer relationships with, with the new people that they meet. These are incredibly challenging tasks. Now imagine that you're in early recovery. So you've decided that you need to, you have a problem with, with drugs or alcohol and you need to stop. And that itself is a very difficult decision. In many ways, going to university is incredibly important in that process. So I talked about building recovery capital. There's no better source of recovery capital than education because education leads to so many other important things in life, not least um, a good job. But as I'm sure you, you're, you're aware, university campuses are a toxic environment if you're trying to remain abstinent from problematic substance use, alcohol or, or, or other behaviors. And so how do you negotiate those two uh, difficult tasks? Well, one answer is uh, the collegiate recovery program. And this is a, this is a concept that is, that is general, uh, uh, that has developed over about 40 or 50 years in the, in the United States on university campuses. And hence the title, the name collegiate recovery program is the established name for this. So it doesn't really fit tremendously well with the UK because we, we would refer to university rather than college. And the program idea is, is again, a very uh, North American idea. But bear with me here. The, 
the universities, um, the first universities started setting up these programs in the 1970s. And since then, there's been a, a steady growth of these programs. So you're now looking at well over 150 university campuses in, in, in uh, the USA and now in Canada have a program like this. And you can see, perhaps you can see in the graphic on the right hand side of the screen, that where these have been set up, they've had quite a big impact. So the graduation rate of students entering uh, a support program like a collegiate recovery program uh, in abstinence, their graduation rate is considerably higher than the university average. And the, and the grade point average, the scores that, that, that students get at, at US uh, universities are, are also um, um, high. So if you get this right, this can be an incredibly uh, important um, issue. This can be an incredibly important way of helping people to negotiate some of these problems and set them on the right path for um, success in life uh, despite uh, addiction. What, do, what does a collegiate recovery program do? Well, there's sort of several elements to it. On the left, you see it says recovery support, and that's the heart of what a collegiate recovery program is about. It's about peer support. It's about students who have identified as being in recovery, supporting each other to maintain that recovery, whilst all, all at the same time getting the most out of their university life. And this would involve um, student uh, meetings on campus, but also linking to other um, mutual aid and other recovery meetings in the wider community around the town or the city that the university is based in. Um, it also involves some elements of um, staff support for individual recovery planning, so helping students to map the pathway to their own recovery and, and linking them to supports that they weren't aware of or that might be useful to them. At the same time, you're trying to maximise educational support, so you're trying to help students that whose learning may have been impacted before they came to university um, to get the most out of the university structures whilst also um, uh, maintaining their recovery. There's, there's uh, an education element for the wider public. So, so the, the students look to, um, the students and the staff running the program look to educate people uh, who are staff, fellow students and members of the local community about the nature of addiction and how it affects people and how they can help with the issue. And of course, underlying this, there's a huge stigma about addiction, which we need to overcome. And the, this is an important way of doing it. There's also, um, uh, an, an outreach program to family support. Families are often um, very concerned about their, their loved ones who are coming to university and leaving home, um, going into an unknown environment. And so there's an, often an outreach program to support families as well. And then the final part involves sober social activities and community outreach. A, a big part of, that, uh, of maintaining recovery and I think in student life generally is about um, reaching out and helping other people um, to, uh, um, to there's a, a saying in, in, um, in um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous that you, you only keep what you've got by giving it away. So by, by helping other people, you help yourself maintain your recovery. So we set out about uh, two years ago to try to replicate that program at a, at a UK university. Now I have to, I have to say, despite that the, the title is correct, but we weren't quite the pioneers here in that, that um, my friend and colleague, Doc, uh, Smith, who works with uh, Recovery Connections up in Middlesbrough, set up a collegiate recovery program at Teesside University. But that was slightly different in that that was led by a peer support organisation um, outside of the university who came in to set up at such a program. In Birmingham, this was the first time we'd actually had a university led program that has involved all elements of the university from the welfare services through all the other departments to try and drive this process. And I'm grateful to um, support from a philanthropic funder who's, who's backed us for this, the first three years of this program. And this diagram shows you the ambition we had of the types of things we were trying to set up. And this sort of maps onto the previous um, chart I showed you. And I'll come back to this to show you where we've got to um, with, with achieving these various elements. But you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, those are the, the various sort of core activities that support the students. In the middle, we, we try and access learning support. We're putting on events for other people on campus. And we're also trying to research and evaluate what, what we're doing here. But there are other more ambitious plans here, outreaching to local schools, taking the recovery idea further upstream, teaching students about um, addiction, linking into forming supportive housing for students um, and developing a student scholarship program for, for, for students in recovery. And, and those that highlighted is what we've achieved as, as, as I'll tell you. Where, where have we got to now? Well, I'm delighted to say that we started in, uh, we launched formally for, for this 
uh, academic year in September 2021. And we were told by colleagues in the States that it would be very slow to get something like this going. So if we found five students and formed a community in the first year, we'd have done very well and things tend to build from that in the next uh, two or three years. Well, through lots of hard work, and, and you'll hear more about it in a minute, but we've actually done a lot better than that. So we've had contact with 31 students uh, since, since September, of which about half, I think it's 17, are actively involved with it, so attending um, uh, sessions every week. You can see there the spread of ages, so the, the majority of them are in the undergraduate ages, but we have a 30% we have a, a, a split of graduate students who, who tend to be older. And we, the interesting thing is the split in the, in the gender. So the, the, on, the, on the top right hand corner that you can see the split that, that in the 31 contacts, 17 were, were male, uh, 15 female, it's 32 contacts actually. But of those that have engaged, there are twice as many um, female contacts than male. So that, that's an interesting um, conundrum in terms of how we're, we're reaching students. We, we're getting them from a range of different places and there's that, that uh, pie chart shows you where they come from. So a lot of them come from our promotional activities through the university's emails and, and other um, media channels. But a large number are starting to come from local recovery meetings and, um, and a range of other different sources. I'm going to I'm going to skip over this because what I want to do now is is introduce you to my my two friends and colleagues in the room here, because this is what I really wanted to cover in, in this session. So I've got to stop sharing and try and move my camera. So I'm joined here by uh, Luke Trainer, who's our um, who's our uh, uh, program manager for the for, for Better Than Well and Chris, who's one of our students. So hopefully that's OK. So, Luke, do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure, yes. So my name is Luke. I'm the um, program manager at Better Than Well. Um, I'm also a student in recovery, so I'm an MSc uh, mental health student at kind of through the IMH. Um, my own experience of, of kind of addiction uh, is that I was the certainly in the 20% that Ed was talking about there of, of some of the most you know, problematic and prolific users. That meant that. For me, my own education um, ended at the age of 14 after um, being kind of uh, excluded from a lot of education because I started my addiction really quite early. I was addicted to alcohol and amphetamines by the age of about 14, or certainly I was, I was seeking help for that. Um, unfortunately, my addiction progressed to, you know, within that one in 20, probably you know, within the top 5% of, of most dangerous kind of uh, addiction in that it was IV, class A, drug use, street using, street homelessness. Um, it wasn't just a, a, a kind of drop off, a, a decline as Ed has described in that, in that really quite good chart. You know, there, is, there are times where people um, are able to find some stability and then lapse, relapse. And, you know, that was very much my story. Um, at, the wor at the worst of my addiction, uh, being, being kind of homeless, um, I, I, got, I enrolled on a access to further education course, still homeless, but I had a yearning and I had a kind of realization around that recovery capital stuff that Ed was talking about, about education. Education seemed to me to be a kind of magic bullet in a way because it is something that I I really was passionate about. I never stopped reading, even in in the in the depths of um, of, of addiction to to crack and heroin. I still I still read a lot. Um, I managed to get through that course, still homeless. Actually, there was a local FE college that allowed me to sleep on the grounds of the college in order that I get, got it done. At the end of that um, educational uh, journey, I went into treatment for my addiction and, um, and I haven't used a, a, a drink or a drug or a mind altering substance or problematic behavior since. Uh, that's five years ago now. Um, when I arrived at the University of Birmingham, I was very, very new in recovery. In fact, I pretty much left treatment and arrived at the University of Birmingham. So I was very excited, but I was also very daunted and 
very unwilling to explain my journey to my peers and even to kind of um, faculty and staff. You know, I, I, I used to come up with a novel excuse each time that I was asked why I was studying so late in life. I was more willing to say that I had mental health problems than I did addiction problems. And I think that speaks volumes, doesn't it? There's a lot of work to be done around stigma and addiction. I loved my study and I did well. Uh, I ended up getting um, first class honours for my undergrad, which, which you know, was pretty amazing considering um, prior to that, you know, I'd been on the streets. So um, very proud, but I didn't have a community. I didn't have uh, peers and I didn't have mutual aid, i.e., you know, a kind of group of people that I could talk to about what I was going through. That, that's something that didn't really exist. Um, so I had a chance encounter with Ed on campus, someone that I've known for a long time um, through the kind of addictions world. I've actually worked with Ed in some of my periods of stability before. Um, and he introduced me to the idea of collegiate recovery, as he's put in the um, presentation there. It's been a successful phenomenon in America for some time. I was massively excited about this. Um, I could really see how it would it would fit in to how it would have fitted into my own education. You know that that idea that um, education could be such a remarkable thing, and how convergent it is with the concept of recovery. The idea of discovery, experimentation, building a new life building a new peer group, opening up the world, you know, I just was very excited. And um, we've now, we've now I've been up and running for a while and, and been able to pass that on to other students who might have arrived at university and not, you know, not had a community they could link into. Um, Prior to that, we've, we've since had our first student who has contacted us to say that he chose the University of Birmingham specifically because it has a collegiate recovery community. And that couldn't be a better kind of um, sign of that, that we're, we're starting to do the right thing. And hopefully, you know, hopefully there'll be a day when that will be how people in recovery decide their education on whether or not there is a collegiate recovery program at their institution. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's enough about me. We'll Chris, Chris. So, so I should have said, of course, that I didn't. Uh, Chris is sporting here our uh, our logo, um, so we're known as better than well uh, at our program. Chris, tell us a bit about your um, how addiction affected you and, and the impact of being a student. Uh, yeah, so. I think it's, it's interesting, you know, we, uh, we sort of saw on the slides the, the, the start of addiction. It's really hard to pinpoint when that was for me. Um, I know in first year I was going out um, on nights out sort of six times a week, uh, which some might say is excessive. Uh, excessive. Um, you know, I, I didn't seem to have those, those on paper consequences. You know, I was still handing in my work on time. I was still somehow making it to my lectures and getting okay grades. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of clung on to that, uh, that idea that on paper, academically, I was still going through it. I'm still doing okay. I'm still keeping my head above water, but really everything else I wasn't. Um, and in second year of university, uh, that really sort of uh, came to the forefront of my life, I guess. And if I, was going to use any word to describe what it's like to be an active addiction at university, I would say isolating, massively, massively isolating. Um, you know, because um, living in a university house, um, how do you explain to people who have never had any education around addiction, probably have never potentially had anyone really close to them uh, who suffered from addiction, that the reason you're stealing their alcohol at three o'clock in the morning and not remembering that you did it isn't because you're a horrible person, but because you can't really help it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, very lonely. Um, you know, there was times 
that I, so I, I was sharing a bathroom in my second year uh, and there was times I would wait in my room and wait until I didn't hear any walking in the corridors and that could be hours, you know, just so I could go to the toilet without anyone hearing me because I couldn't face anyone in my house. Um, and, you know, I think, I'm, I'm not sure whether me being at university and being under the sort of constant scrutiny of handing in assignments and, and that sort of stuff and, and watching the on paper things you know start to decline and me not you know coping academically I, I don't know if that's maybe a reason that I you know started to seek help sooner than I potentially could have if uh, I wasn't in a university setting um, but sort of like Luke sort of mentioned when I first started to try to seek help from welfare I didn't want to say anything about addiction. Uh, I didn't want to mention that I have an issue with uh, substances and with alcohol, um, because you know how how do you come and tell uh, an institution which has a zero drug policy that you've got a problem with alcohol and drugs, and that you know you sometimes turn up to lectures in not the best state. You know it it didn't feel right, and so I would definitely say. I've got mental health issues and this and that. And even after I finally got to the stage where I was ready to, to mention and, and sort of say, I've got an issue with drinking, um, the sort of response that I got was, okay, we're gonna give you some pamphlets um, and we're gonna give you some extensions. Um, and I don't know whether there was more an offer at the time, that's kind of how I felt. I felt like once again, I was still isolated. I wasn't, I, I felt like I was the only person going through that. Um, and you know, because I was so sort of young and I'm, I'm young in recovery, uh, you know, we hear something in, in 12 step uh, meetings, which is look for the similarities and not the differences, but I could only see the differences because in the movies I've watched, it's only, you know, middle-aged men that go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, it's only homeless people that go to Narcotics Anonymous. It's, it's this like, you know, those stereotypes that really uh, led what I believed um, addiction and potentially recovery to be. Uh, and so I found it very hard for me to turn around and say, okay, maybe I'm an addict because I had all this information around me saying, you're at university, um, you, you, you have a roof over your head, you're not entirely broke. Well, I was, but I still had parents that could <laughs> fund me. Um, you know, and one of the Big sort of issues around it is okay a i mentioned about uh people not really um understanding addiction at university but when i would sort of pull myself together uh to stop drinking for these sort of short periods and was back out um in the world um the way that it seemed most of my friends who were concerned about me would try to help me would be like let's go to the pub and talk about it you know because that's a very natural thing for university students to do is because it seems like university culture whether it's uh, sports societies whether it's just you know academic societies is all centered around this uh, this drinking culture which makes it even further you know even more isolating and so chris can i ask you what what so you've been you were one of the first students to join when we started in september tell us a bit about your experience of what what this better than well program has done for you so more than anything it's given me a community of students um who are in the same position that i am um you know show me that i'm not alone uh you know not not only you know as as a young person in, in recovery as you know if you go to outside meetings you're i'm usually one of the youngest people there uh but also you know at university um you know, people are going through the same things as you. They're going through the same stresses of, um, you know, trying to excel academically, uh, but then trying to like balance that with recovery. And, you know, we're able to talk about these common problems um, together. And, you know, I actually feel like I'm part of something, um, which I would have loved to say I, I felt part of 12 step fellowships outside, but because of, the differences, I think I found that very hard to, I found it hard to relate to the, the common sort of population of 12 step fellowships. So actually having people who are the same age as me doing the same 
things me, i.e. trying to get through university um, has been such a massive, uh, such a massive change for me and um, has allowed me to, you know, currently be in one of the longest periods of sobriety that I've had and feeling great as well. Not sort of white knuckling it, which is nice. Um, yeah. Uh, that's absolutely brilliant. I, I, I'm going to go back to um, the main view, excuse me. There we go. Um, and I'm just going to finish up and then we've got we've got the opportunity to ask uh, Chris and Luke um, further questions if that if that's helpful. So let me just go back to my um, slides here if they work, which is always a bit of a gamble when you turn them off. Let me know if they don't appear. Um, so just to finish up, what I wanted to um, to say was, so we've started this program, it's it's building um, week by week, both in terms of numbers and also in terms of what we offer. So we have a, a weekly celebration of recovery meeting, which is where the, um, all the students get together. We have uh, links to uh, shares from other people in the wider recovery community in Birmingham. We have um, uh, meditation sessions. We have individual one-to-one -one sessions available in our drop-in. Um, and we're starting to, Chris, Chris is the social secretary for the uh, for the for the group, and so we have sober socials uh, once a month. Um, so things are really moving, um, but we're in this phase now of of now we've got things going. How do we evaluate what we're doing, and what's the uh, research agenda behind this? And I, um, I th this paper came out at about the time we started, and I've been in contact with Noel and, and the team at Stanford. Um, this was reviewing the. 20 or 30 years of active work in the American programs and there's still a lot of questions unanswered so there's quite a bit of research but it's it tends to be uh, small numbers and uh, limited methodologically and, and I mean our ultimate goal would be to try to determine whether these sort of approaches work as compared to what happens normally but as you heard from Chris what happens normally is often very re relatively little so I'd be very surprised if anything didn't make a difference um, we're very interested in trying to work out, we've got a great opportunity in the UK because my one of my other goals with my National Recovery Champion hat on is to try and spread this idea to other universities and there's a lot of interest in that. Um, but we're going to participate in this, which is um, in the States, Virginia Commonwealth University has started up a um, cohort study and has um, quite a large number of, of, of different programs in the States uh, joined up. Relatively small numbers at the moment, but this will be a um, uh, uh, administration of a standardized set of questionnaires, questionnaires looking at um, some of the issues that I've got on the slide there about current functioning and engagement with recovery over time. So this, is, this might be a really good way of um, looking at how our students progress in, 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 um, with our support, tailoring what we do to their needs and also comparing us to, to more established programs in, in the US. Um, the other area that we're very interested in is stigma, and you heard it mentioned there, this is surely the biggest barrier. Um, the wellbeing services are excellent at the University of Birmingham, but still don't really get many people coming to talk about these issues, largely because of the stigma. And we've, we've, we're looking to get a, a PhD funded, and hopefully Luke will be doing a PhD looking at this area, particularly about how we can, how we can actually actively intervene with stigma. If I surveyed people, on the campus uh, at Birmingham staff or students, they'd be no different to anyone else in the UK. There would be stigmatized attitudes to addiction. What we want to know is how can we overcome that? And one of the really interesting things working with young people is rather like Chris said there, lots of them have said, one of the biggest problems is going is, is, is talking to anyone about it at all. And there's a problem with talking to different people, your family, your friends, your university um, lecturers and, and, and tutors. So we want to look at evaluating something like this. This is Honest, Open and Proud, which is a, it came from the mental health field. It's a way of helping people work through the idea of talking to others about their problems and in this case addiction. And we're going to look to try and use the expertise of our student group in our program to help us um, develop and evaluate a program to help other students talk about these issues more confidently and more effectively. And I hope that will also lead on to um, a wider project. So just to finish up, the, the U Universities UK has launched this month a task force, which I, Luke and I are both involved in, actually, which is, a, which is going to look at drug use. So that's only one aspect of, of the wider issue of addiction, but it's perhaps the one that's least discussed. And Chris mentioned the, the zero tolerance that many universities have towards drugs. That's really not helping the situation. So we want to try and... Um, 
help people overcome this difficulty about talking about issues um, because you can't get help unless you unless you talk about them and this is perhaps what we're aiming for is that this is this comes from another uh, this is a, this is um, West Virginia University this is an example of an ally scheme where you your um, your uh, uh, students or staff that are involved in our program can help train other interested people in how to think about addiction how to talk about addiction with other people so I'll finish there that's a summary of what we're doing better than well and uh, that's how to contact us and we're we're open for any questions anyone may have uh, thanks very much so thank you very much Ed, Luke and Chris for such an interesting <clears throat> presentation and also for sharing your your own experiences so I think we all learned a lot about the addictions and as well about the better than well program um, so now please start adding your your questions uh, in, in the Q&A. So I already have some questions in mind, but anyways, uh, there is already uh, one question from, from one person from the audience. So I will start reading and then I will continue with mine if there are no more questions in the meantime. So uh, Wendy Dosset, she is asking, um, how did you navigate institutional objections to the program if there were any? And were they legitimate or stigma-based? Well, thank you, Wendy. We, I'll, I'll admit it. That Wendy's a friend and colleague from uh, from the University of Chester, and we've we've discussed these issues. This is a really key topic. So you'd think, well, I thought that uh, developing a program supporting young people who have overcome major issues in their life to um, go on and be excellent graduates of the university would be a massive cause for celebration and something that not every university would want to embrace. But of course, as Wendy alludes to, that's not the case. And a University of Birmingham is no different to any other university in that there's, um, because universities are big corporate entities now, the image is very important to prospective students. And, and there's a need, as there is in wider society very often, to project this image of a zero tolerance to drugs. And bizarrely, that extends to people in recovery from, from, from drug issues as well. And of course, we're talking about far more than drugs. So, and in many ways, things, behavioral addictions, so, so problems with um, gambling or gaming or, or sex, pornography, these issues are even more hidden um, than, than those wider, wider problems. But I was aware of that issue and I took guidance from, from some of the American universities. It took me about 18 months and it was during the heart of lockdown, which probably made it worse. But I, I basically almost got up to the VC level in terms of discussing with, with people in, in Birmingham about how, whether we should do this. And the experience was largely the same, that I would talk and they would be sceptical, uh, worried. They, their thoughts immediately go to me bringing problems to the university and that there'd be um, you know, lots of controversy about this. But it didn't take long. And having Luke tell his story very often to this really added a human aspect to this and people I, I must say that that I've had enormous help from from all over the university from from and th th this reaches virtually every department because one of the things we're trying to do you know we're looking to try and develop recovery uh, abstinent accommodation within the university offer we're looking to get into the the registry and student services so that um, no student that runs into trouble with drugs or alcohol gets thrown out of the university without um, speaking to us first we're looking to, you know, we're, we're getting into all aspects of well-being in the university. And, and in this case, through that long, slow process, it's been it's been no problem. And I have to I have to add another plug that getting the philanthropic um, funding. So many thanks to uh, Christina, who led that process. That has really helped in terms of, you know, kickstart this program. But it but it is it's the sort of thing you have to spend your time working on and think about the different layers. And and a lot of education and it shouldn't be that way but but it is and you just have to start with that acceptance and then move forward from there i would say thank you Ed. uh the next question is for from matt early and so he's asking how do you plan on extending this across the uk to other universities that's a that's a very good question so built into this idea was that we would try and disseminate the idea so so very early on while I was in the process of talking to to the university about it I was talking to lots of other universities so I have a platform in that I have this national role and I talk about it at every opportunity and I'd got about uh, 20 or 25 universities that, that had people that were interested it could be anyone it could be a student in some cases it could be a member of staff 
could be a member of the well-being services, academic, it doesn't matter. And we've, we've had one meeting talking about how to disseminate this. But I think um, one of the goals of this is the learning from this year will be to to write almost a, a guide on how to how to how to do this step by step. The American universities have done this, but of course, the culture is slightly different over there. So you have to adapt it for a UK um, situation. I have to say that that Universities UK project, although it sort of set out as uh, at the other end of my spectrum that I showed you at the beginning, so it was talking more about harm reduction and and students who are starting to experiment with drugs, they've really embraced this idea. So I think it will become part of that program because people have never heard of it. They, when we talk about it, people have never heard of anything like this. And it is only one, I keep emphasizing, it's one part of the spectrum. It's not the whole thing. We're not, we're not advocating banning alcohol on, on campuses or, 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 or getting involved in that side of things. We're just dealing with one end of that that spectrum but the goal is very much to try and use any means possible to to get the idea of this out there to to other um, universities thank you ed so well, now we are having like <laughs> several questions that we have like now four left so then this is like this is great in that sense so now we have one question from anonymous but uh he is asking can students be at any stage of their addiction to join the program for example, uh, still using drugs, alcohol? I'll, I'll hand that one over to Luke. Luke. Yes, so addiction isn't as neat. I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone this, but it's not um, It's not as neat as, as we would like it to be when we kind of develop these programmes. So the stage of, of someone's addiction that we're available for people is the stage at which they have decided that they need help. Um, and that might be that there's a period of you know, not being able to remain abstinent straight away. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't close the door on people. Um, but what I would say is that abstinence is the goal of, of a programme like this. And that's a kind of, that's the way things have been with recovery historically because there have been so many kind of pharmaceutical interventions before. So we, we, we're, apart from that, we are an abstinence-based program. So we are trying to help people towards an abstinence-based lifestyle. That's not prescriptive in terms of a particular ideology or intervention or kind of treatment program. Um, there's a lot of us that aren't, you know, 12 step recovery, there are, there are some that are, um, the smart recovery as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. it. You will often find that for those people that are, that are struggling, they will kind of take some time out themselves. Like we don't need to kind of say, what well, the door's closed, you're, you know, you, you, you've lapsed, you're not allowed back. But quite naturally people will kind of regroup and then of course the door is always open. You can't have recovery communities with closed doors. You just cannot, you know, we've got to this point where the recovery kind of revolution that, that, that kind of started in, in the 1940s in America has reached every corner of the world based on an open door policy. A desire towards abstinence and recovery is all that is required. So, uh, actually, Chris, I don't know whether you want to say your, your experience was yeah. was relevant um, here. Yeah, definitely. So, I came out of uh, treatment, came into uh, BTW. Uh, so, you, you so just to clarify, you were in a residential rehab during the yeah. during the break uh, during before? the summer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I came into BTW sober, and I had uh, two relapses in my first. Uh, sort of uh, in, my, in my first semester and sort of like Luke uh, mentioned when at least when I relapsed I, I don't really want to be talking to people in recovery <laughs> um, so you know I kind of took myself away from it and then you know when I was ready or when I was sober or trying to get sober that's the that's the point that I came back to BTW and, and the fact that I was met um, just with with love and with um concern with you know an attitude just wanting to, to help me um it made such a massive difference knowing that i i was still accepted and that i hadn't let anyone down 
you know, it, it was such a massive part of, of my recovery and probably the reason that I'm, I've been sober for quite a while now. It's a really good question because, um, so, so I showed you that spectrum and undoubtedly there are far more people in the using, developing problems end than there are in the, in the absent recovery end. But what this program does is two things. It, 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 firstly, it, um, it's a sort of Trojan horse to get into the system to start talking about the issue. And clearly you have to be abstinent to attend our programs because you couldn't have people that were turning up intoxicated uh, or whatever. But it's true to say that we've had a number of people who are experimenting with, with abstinence and this has given them an opportunity to do it. So they've met people for the first time who are doing it. I, I, the, the second thing is that I've really been struck by doing this, by how little is provided for, for students in, in this area. So we talk about a continuum of care. So there needs to be treatment efforts for people that are actively having significant problems through to the support for remaining absent, which is what we're doing. But that just doesn't exist in that in the, the university provides very little, nor does any university, uh, to be honest. And if you look at young people's services in the, in, in the city, I don't think any student would have would find them easy to access because they're just not geared up to that group of people. So where do students go? Where, where it's, it's a very difficult issue. My role, I suppose, so, so Luke and I work quite well together. Luke leads the, uh, you know, being a student in recovery, Luke is ideally placed to lead the, the, the group and, and, and the, the peer support side. My role is to sit slightly one side of that and to, to pick up people who are clearly in trouble but perhaps can't. So we, we've had one example very recently of a student who is still very much locked in active addiction. So what we've done is, is arranged to get them treatment elsewhere. So they're actually going to a residential uh, rehab treatment. And then we'll be there for the second they leave that to, to come back in to join our, our community, which is a bit, bit like uh, Chris's experience. Thank you, Luke, Chris and Annette for, for all the detailed answers. So we still like have well, seven, but I will try like to to go through well most of the questions, and then if not, well, thank you very much for for everybody for raising the their questions. So this is from Rachel at the group. So Rachel is uh, saying a really lovely talk and colleagues. Thank you. So um, I wonder about sustainability. How do we get by in funding going forward from academic institutions? Very good question, and the one that's uh, really. Um, troubling us at the moment, I suppose. Um, we're, we're fortunate and we have um, the philanthropic funding that's, that's kicked this process off. I, my goal is very much to get, get this embedded within the university's offer. So that I think would be um, success in the future. So getting uh, at least Luke's role um, actually sustainably um, inc incorporated within the, the university's welfare budget, I think is, is not an unreasonable hope and expectation. We also, uh, what happens in the United States is that, um, so, so the most successful university at developing this is Texas Tech um, in Lubbock in Texas. And they have a quarter of a million dollars a year of student scholarships. Um, and that's my goal is that I think there is, there's quite a bit of, um, th th there's philanthropic funding out there. There's, uh, there's other funding that would support students. I mean, this is a, what, who wouldn't want to invest in a person who's gonna go on? I mean, I'll, we'll finish up this by Chris telling you where, where he's gonna go next year. Um, and and you, can, you, can judge, <laughs> you can judge whether that's a success. But, but I, 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 you know, we're, we're investing in people here and I think there'll be no shortage of people um, wanting to do that. From the university's perspective, this is a widening participation issue. So we've talked, we focused on the younger students, but Luke's an example also of a large number of people who, who have come out of active addiction, maybe 10, 20 years of active addiction, and then want to get back into, into university and have fantastic track records when, when they do so, because they're highly motivated. Well, Luke's a great example, first in his, in his undergraduate degree um, and looking to do a, a PhD now. And I think that's that's how, we're, and then the other aspect of sustainability is that in that uh, we're trying to develop a um, a UK addiction recovery research institute, which will, at the heart of it, will develop co-produced uh, research. And so, people with lived experience doing the research is very much the heart of what what we want to achieve. Because I think it's the only way we will will make meaningful inroads into things like stigma and, and, and other issues. But it's a good question, Rachel. It's not one I've got an answer to at the minute, but it's it's an aspiration. 
Thank you. So maybe I can finish, I guess, with the last question. And then as well, I think we all want to know maybe when Chris is going next as well, I see like a success of, of the program. <laughs> <I love laughs> that, yeah. You can say now. So Chris, go on, tell us where you're at. Uh... Um, so, yeah, <laughs> uh, I've kind of uh, gone from in January, having spent most of my January applying for investment banking grad schemes um, to now I'm in a position where my priorities have changed to what I think is a much better option. Uh, you guys can judge it. Uh, I'm going to be moving to Los Angeles and I've received a scholarship to attend the American Academy of Dramatic Arts over there. Um, yeah, success mm -hmm. or, or midlife, quarter life crisis, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very really exciting. I mean, yeah, I'm jealous now. <laughs> but, but it is one of the, and I know our, our, our funder is very keen to help us develop, um, you know, an, an extension of this program is developing internships and other opportunities um, for peer mentoring in big uh, organisations for people in recovery. There are lots of, as about, you know, it's estimated 4 to 5% of the, of the population are in recovery from, from, from one, of the, one of the various issues. And there's a huge um, group of people out there that want to support and mentor and, and offer opportunities. So, and this is an example of it, but, but we're looking to extend that to the, the wider sort of world of business and, and, other, and other areas. But I don't know about what, maybe the acting profession might be, might be another area that we have to move into, Chris. <laughs> And I can I still there for a minute left, so I can end with the last question. So this is from Janet Hamill. And she's asking, do you think there are ways to support the students on professional courses, for example, undergrad social work or nursing to remain on their courses and complete studies? She worked in a Scottish age institution in undergrad nursing and this subject was not discussed unless it was to remove the students. So Thank this you. is, that's a really good, and that was one of my passions. So I spent, um, I've, I've had two stints at the University of Birmingham. The first was of about 10 years in the medical school. And I was in, when the old system, when academics did the welfare, I was the welfare tutor for the, for one of the academic years. And I did used to see quite a few students um, who were in recovery, who were medical students, but of course were terrified of mentioning it because they were, they were, they were scared about it impacting their course. I think we've got, a, we, we, in fact, we've had examples of this this year already in that actually the group in treatment um, with the best outcomes of anyone, of any treatment program anywhere in the world are professionals. So usually doctors and airline pilots are the two examples, but nurses and other professionals would be, would be up there, which is where you have a program that, where abstinence is usually much more important, that, 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 that abstinence is what you have to maintain, but your, your work is contingent on you being involved in recovery initiatives and, and activities. And if you can combine that, get those two things right, it can really work well in terms of long-term um, abstinence and, and, and good health, but also maintaining work. So I think this, absolutely, the professional courses are definitely an area. And we're looking to broaden this out um, to the other universities in Birmingham as well. That's the next step. So you know, looking at the ones with more vocational courses, BCU particularly, would I think we'd find a lot of students there that are um, that, that might well benefit from from this program. So that's a really good question. So thank you very much to, to the three of you, to Ed, Luke and Chris. So I think, I mean, I think this has been like an, an amazing presentation as well as was as well <laughs> mentioning some of the Q&A questions as well. It was very exciting uh, presentation. So thank you very much. And Wishing you all the best as well in the in this program and your future, Chris, in, in LA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank